Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome, everyone, to the Community IT Innovators Webinar Nonprofit IT Expert Roundtable. This is always one of our most popular webinars every year. We have a panel of our senior staff here today to talk about essential trends in nonprofit tech and what that means for nonprofits. They're going to talk about cybersecurity and cloud computing. My name is Carolyn Woodard. I'm the Outreach Director for Community IT, and I'm the moderator today. My name is Johan Hermestrom. I'm the CEO at Community IT. My name is Matthew Eshelman, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Community IT. And I'm Steve Longenecker. I'm the Director of IT Consulting at Community IT. We're entering an interesting time where the most important things in IT right now are probably the least exciting, <laughs> the least interesting, right? We all want to talk about AI. But you probably should be rewriting your IT policies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is a great um, segue. We have a question in from someone who wants to know, well, community IT provide device lockdown to nonprofits with all remote teams, meaning to limit the use of the device to help increase cybersecurity. So you were talking earlier about being able to deploy the laptops uh, remotely to the end users. And I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Matt to be able to talk about cybersecurity. And I think that relates to governance as well. Like what is your your policy for um, that use? So I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, So we're going to talk a little bit more about cybersecurity, um, issues with cybersecurity insurance, um, some hacks that are recently in the news, um, MFA and SSO and what, what those means and, and what that will mean for nonprofits and whether the funders are keeping up and um, cybersecurity decisions, like who's making cybersecurity decisions. I feel like that used to be something that like somebody in the IT office would just like do something and then everybody would like have to take the training or what have you. So I know there've been some changes in that. So Matt, do you want to take that on? Uh, yeah, so I think there's a lot of a lot of different things in there, and uh, thanks for the question. And yeah, please feel free to chat in any additional uh, questions that you may have. Uh, so, in terms of kind of device management, uh, I'll I'll take that actually in a couple couple different pieces. So, you know, talking about technology adoption, the tools that Community IT have used for I don't know for over over ten or fifteen years have really been cloud centric. So, no matter where devices were, they could kind of check back in uh, and be managed with uh, the tools we had. So that was helpful as organizations or, you know, supporting staff working, working all over the place. Um, I think the interesting kind of side uh, kind of element to that question in terms of maybe device lockdown is, is kind of employee monitoring or productivity tracking. There's kind of a whole cottage industry of those type of solutions. And I will say, uh, you know, in general, we have not, deployed or uh, even recommended those type types of solutions to be in place. You know, I think our approach uh, has been largely to, you know, manage and, and kind of handle staff performance in, in other ways. And so, again, if you were having problems with staff while they were in the office uh, or, or not, you know, kind of just that transition to remote work, um, you know, maybe exacerbated that or, or, uh, you know, kind of didn't, didn't change it. And so, you know, the idea that you're going to have like a technology way to kind of monitor your way out of employee performance and productivity is, is kind of not something that we've really gotten into. Um, you know, I think that being said, I think kind of coming back to Johan's point about the employee handbook, I think having that content in there, like, well, what, what are the expectations around, you know, kind of personal or incident, incidental use of a corporate asset to be used for personal, you know, traffic or personal use. I think that's a, a discussion that the organization needs to have uh, and that needs to be clearly communicated. I think the same thing goes for mobile devices uh, as is the case. You know, many people are, are using their personal devices to access corporate data. And I think nonprofits have in general been, you know, in favor of that, have been happy 
that's like been a nice thing to be able to do. Uh, and again, I think our the pendulum is now kind of swinging back to realize like, oh, well, you know, we've got a lot of staff turnover and people are syncing their email and maybe, you know, the contact list or all kinds of information about our organization, about the people that we interact with. And then that leaves with them because we don't have a way to uh, control what, what data is act, being accessed from their mobile device. And so I think organizations are now getting into the point where they're being deliberate around the policies that they are uh, establishing to, to kind of govern that access. And then, you know, making sure that there's technology solutions that can help support um, support those controls. So talking a little bit about um, controls, I was reviewing what we said last year in terms of cyber liability insurance, you know, really driving um, adoption of technology solutions and, and policy solutions. Uh, you know, and I think that trend only accelerated. I think we did a great webinar uh, several months back with um, Jenna uh, Howard from Locked In, which is a, a, a big insurance broker. Uh, and in that, you know, shared some really, uh, you know, kind of that hard data that, that we were seeing from the different clients that we were supporting through their cyber liability insurance applications, the underwriting requirements were becoming a lot more strict. Uh, and then the policy renewals themselves were becoming a lot more expensive. Uh, and that was forcing organizations to implement delayed cybersecurity projects, you know, make changes to, you know, how they were using and supporting technology. And that has only continued. Like, I don't think we've seen relief from those year over year price increases and the cyber liability insurance applications seem to be even longer this year than they were last year. Um, so I think that continues to drive a lot of the change and adoption for uh, nonprofit organizations. I think kind of on that, in that same vein, the a lot of the technology controls, I think, because nonprofits are, uh, I think, leading edge when it comes to adopting cloud technology solutions, uh, that really helps with a lot of the the technology control adoption. Um, there's there's huge sections that really govern or are really focused on on premise controls and remote access to on premise environments. And for a lot of organizations, even up to those with 100, you know, 150 staff. Uh, you know, it is now realistic to actually not have or not need any on-premise servers or equipment, which actually makes your um, you know, overall security footprint a lot smaller uh, and means that you can, you know, a lot more easily respond to those questions where it says, like, do you have MFA enabled on everything? And so if you try to en enable MFA on a local server is a really uh, big technical challenge. It's a huge headache. So if you don't have a server, then, you know, you don't have that uh that requirement and it really makes uh, responding to those applications a lot um a lot easier matt wouldn't you say uh, that there's a that one trend that we've seen for years and years and years <laughs> is that you know bureaucracies that that in some ways the the re, these requirements that are sort of bureaucratic in nature like like the cybersecurity, like there's a there's a, obviously a lot of good stuff there and we're we're always delighted when a client asks us to help them implement, implement multi-factor authentication, even if the reason that they're doing it is for a cybersecurity uh, insurance policy, fine. Whatever your reason mm -hmm. is, it's good. Thank God you're getting multi-factor mm -hmm. authentication. But some of the things that people are being asked to do, like I know we have a client that is has a lot of remote staff and, and having to update their password every, I don't know whether it's every three months or six months to meet their cybersecurity mm -hmm insurance requirements is a real headache for them. And, and nowadays, you know, we're seeing, you know, Microsoft issue guidance that, you know, password list is the way to go anyway. Like they're just like changing your password every six months has its own costs, including the mm -hmm. fact that people tend to write them down because they can't remember them because they're changing them all the time, et cetera. Um, so those insurance policy questionnaires are, are interesting. I guess I should just leave it at I that. I think, I think we're, it's sort of like when they were developing auto insurance in the 1920s, you know, they had no data to go off of the best practices on how to actually make people secure was still being figured out. And so these questionnaires are just the best guess by right. the carriers as to what actually, because their, their concern is not necessarily like security. Their concern is to minimize claims. Right. And so there's still, and so the industry is very much in flux right now. And what that means is it's become a lot harder to complete those questionnaires because um, 
a lot of the things they're asking you to do don't always make sense because they're just basing it off of, you know, the data that they're collecting um, from claims that have been filed over the last few years. So talking about um, security and MFA, we have a question in the chat. Do you think uh, single sign-on is really the theme for 2023, Matt, or should we pursue pass keys whole hog? <laughs> Uh, hey, somebody maybe somebody hacked into our system and like read our <laughs> read our presentation in advance. Um, because yeah, I think uh, so. Identity, so digital identity and security around the digital identity, I think is is where we see most of the threats um, coming. So I'm I'm actually just in the process of of reviewing and and kind of analyzing all of the data that our team has you know responded to over 2022 in terms of like the security incidents, uh, and you know for the past number of years, you know the biggest risk that I think that organizations face is really around that that digital identity right your account gets compromised then your account is used to target other organizations or your account is then used to you know try to open up bank accounts and that kind of thing so i think for the small to mid sized organization your digital identity is really the the key um and that requires i think the most focus i think that's why we've been so uh you know uh, emphatic up around multi factor authentication uh, I think a couple of early data points that I'm seeing in, in the data uh, this year is that um, I saw some more cases where we were responding to compromised accounts beyond just the primary user identity, their Office 365 account or their Google account. You know, a person's Facebook account gets compromised, their LinkedIn account gets compromised, like something else. Um, and so that's why I think single sign-on becomes really uh, appealing. Uh, kind of interestingly enough, like single sign-on with your one username and and password combination, then that kind of grants you, that identity then grants you access to many other linked systems, um, as opposed to using a password manager where you are just storing that username and password in, in the application, and then that's getting inserted into all of those different websites. And so if you can... Um, uh, in the event of a, a breach, right? So we had LastPass is the is the you know the, the year end security you know nightmare that everybody's uh, reading about. Um, you know if you're if you were involved in that or caught up in that, like now you really need to go through and you should reset all the passwords in there. And so if you're like me, you know that could be a hundred or several hundred accounts that you need to go through and update and reset. Uh, whereas if you were in a single sign on environment that would be one password, right? Um, and so the mechanics of maintaining the integrity of that digital identity, um, it's a lot uh, easier to kind of monitor, uh, adapt, and then you know, address if there, uh, if there are problems in the future. And so I do think that uh, you know, the, the, the barrier to implement single sign-on uh, for your organization really continues to fall. And so now if you're, you know, even 10, 15 staff um, organization implementing single sign-on would probably be a good use of time because there's so many uh, integrations that are now available that mean that you can do that implementation if you're an Office 365 or if you're a Google customer, uh, there are easy ways to do that integration. Vendors like Okta, you know, continue to be a good partner to the nonprofit sector in terms of offering discounts and donations. And so you can get a really great enterprise grade single sign on solution to help protect that digital identity um, in a way I think that's much more effective than um, password managers can can be. So, um, yeah, so I think it's a, a great a great question, and, and I would certainly advocate for for SSO solutions to be at the top of any organization's list as they look at what they're going to pursue uh, in 2023. We have a couple more questions in the chat, Matt. One is, how does MFA work for multiple volunteers who need to access a nonprofit computer, especially if they don't have a phone for authentication or their other devices? And um, we had another question that was, how does single sign-on work with multiple apps and integrations? We do have a, a blog post um, up about kind of the basics of single sign-on. So um, I'll put that in the transcript, but I wonder if you wanted to answer MFA best practices for like volunteers or um, people who don't have a phone. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I do think, you know, understanding where the risk is at for your organization is an important um, part of that. I do think for, for most organizations, uh, you know, kind of the risk associated with, you know, somebody hacking into your local computer because they have physical access to your office is relatively, um, you know, relatively low. So, so thinking about multi-factor on a computer is, you know, may not be uh, kind of a high priority for your organization. You know, I do think as much as you can um, support it, uh, multi-factor authentication and named accounts for your volunteers would be a great idea because, uh, you know, you want to have some auditing and accountability for kind of who's making changes. And so if you've got a situation where like every volunteer is using the same account and going in and like updating the database or deleting things, um, that can create a problem with accountability. Uh, so in terms of multi-factor authentication, then for those accounts, there are, uh, you can give physical tokens. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, different ways um, to do that. Uh, but I would say, you know, so there are a number of good third-party uh, token you know, if you want to give somebody a, a little key fob that has the rotating uh, number keys on it or a, as a way to, to provide that challenge, um, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, ideally, you know, you could, some, some MFA is better than none. And so if you can get to a point where you've got named individual accounts with some type of MFA, that's certainly preferable to, uh, you know, shared accounts uh, or no MFA. Uh, so again, as, as, as much progress as you can make kind of down that road to, you know, everybody having their own login with a linked app based MFA, you know, that's the direction to go. Those key fobs are getting a lot cheaper for sure. They're, they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're definitely a good option. We, we have another question that came in around funding um, and about the different tiers for subscriptions for um, single sign-on that you might need to have and not be able to afford. Um, Matt, I know that you've worked with some funders. Do you, is this, is this something that's changing? Are funders starting to fund more like cybersecurity training and then actually specific, you know, licenses for nonprofits to have better cybersecurity or is it still kind of you have to do it, but how you're going to pay for it is a question. Um, so I think, I mean, there's a couple of different pieces there. So I'd say one, the actual platform for organizations to, to build their single sign-on is typically going to be free or very low cost. So again, if you're in Google, you know, just kind of out of the box, you can use Google to do single sign-on for a lot of different applications. The same thing, like if, in your, if you're a Microsoft Office 365 customer, uh, if you have the P1 license, um, which is included as part of their 10 free um, Microsoft Business Premium licenses, right? That gives you the ability to do single sign-on. Uh, I think Okta for Good through their donation program will give, I think it's 50 free licenses. So for most organizations, the, the cost to get started with single sign-on is very low. Uh, where the, the costs can creep in are the applications that you want to integrate with. I don't know, Slack or something like you have to have you know, the upgraded tier and that costs and maybe you're the, the business basic. So, um, so again, I think I, that's, tr I think that trend has changed. I mean, I, I, mm. I can't predict what individual vendors are going to do, but I do feel like SSO is going to become more and more table stakes. You don't get to, you don't get to make it a premium service. Mm -hmm. And that might not all have, that may be, it may be uh, optimistic to call that a 2023 trend, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's the beginning. Like at this point, there was a time, I think, when MFA was considered kind of a premium service that if you wanted to have MFA, you might need to pay a little bit more. And now mm -hmm. if you don't offer MFA, you know, what kind of service are you providing? Um, I and think, I think it's going to happen yeah. with SSO the same way. It might take a couple more years for the vendors to catch up to that. But I just think it's going to be a reality. I agree with you, Steve. I think the exception will be like SaaS solutions that have like a small office, home office you know, offering and then a business. Sure. Offering. If it's just then built it, into their business model, just to say like, like oh, you're, you're or like two or yeah. three people, you're not getting SSO. You have to be a mm -hmm. business, you know? Right. So I could mm -hmm. see that not changing, but I think you're right. Like the, the kind of extreme, the having an additional cost on top of the business licenses you're already paying for. I agree with you that that should be going away. So maybe our advice is to, to wait that out. I don't know. It's a tough call. I mean, I do think single sign on is very important. So at some point, you know, I do get I do get frustrated sometimes with people who 
and I don't want to put this on the person who, who asked that question it was a great question, but you know, it's like electricity, it costs so much. What am I going to do? It's like, well, <laughs> like you'd got to run a business, you know, you got to have electricity. I don't I'm not sure SSO is on the level with electricity yet, but some of these cybersecurity things are becoming, you know, yeah, but I, I, I do think, I mean, I'm sympathetic because I do think there are some software vendors who are just like, it's kind of like, well, you get, you pay this right. much for access, but if you want to, if you want to protect your data with a password, <laughs> you got to like buy more. It's like, that's right. irresponsible to be selling Agreed. a solution. You can't. Agreed. Yeah. It will trade. It will, it will change. It, it'll, but I, for that reason, I think it, we will see it change. I, I want to we... make sure this is a great conversation, but I want to make sure that we have a little time for cloud computing and, um, and let Steve talk a little bit more about some of how we use technology now and maybe formal training versus kind of training yourself and how that is changing and um, how nonprofits are, like we talked before, there's kind of settling into the tools that they're using and, and what you're seeing in that, in that line, Steve. I'm going to, jump back. I do think we missed, I will do that in a second. I do think we missed uh, the, the, the question about single sign on versus pass keys that uh, the, the, one of the um, audience members asked. Um, and so pass key, I think referring to sort of the whole passwordless approach that, you know, Microsoft is now, did they recently put out a press release because it got, it got written up in the Washington post, which is my home paper. Like it, it's got, it's getting some attention because they put out, they must've put out some good marketing on it. Um, I feel like this, speaking of trends, I feel like that's um, coming, 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 but the whole passwordless approach is maybe something that we'll be talking about on this trends conversation um, a year from now or so. Like, I feel like, like Microsoft's blazing the trail. They're definitely pointing the way, but you know, my, it's only this year's past that like all my bank accounts have finally gotten good, you know, decent MFA on them. And like, you'd think a bank would be ahead of the game on that, but they're just not. It's like some of these things just take time to come into place. Um, all right. So shifting to cloud computing. Yeah. It was my assignment to maybe speak a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing in, in, in cloud computing specifically. Um, and we identified three um, when we were doing our prep for this, for this webinar um, one of the things that we've observed, and this may not be a trend for 2023 per se, but it's a trend that we've seen, you know, gaining uh, speed. And it fits with what Johan was talking about um, when talking about office management with the fact that so much stuff got rolled out so quickly by necessity during the uh, pandemic. Um, you know, the whole, the whole, sh there's a shift uh, about how training issues are addressed and, and, and maybe there just wasn't, didn't feel like there was a good opportunity in some ways to do a lot of formal training, um, you know, during the pandemic and the way you might've done training in the past was get, get everybody together in a conference room and that wasn't possible. But we are observing that in general, um, that uh, there's less training for a lot of, of uh, platforms and um, technologies uh, there's much more of a sort of the user self services and also kind of, I think this was, you know, this is something that in some ways Apple sort of famously made part of their brand. They were certainly not the only one that does it, but like no instruction manual. It's so intuitive. You just, you just like do it. And, um, and so you don't need a, a training on how to use an iPhone. A three-year-old can pick up an iPhone and figure out how, how to use it. I mean, these are the, these are the ideas. I'm not sure how true that is um but um so i we we are we still have requests for training um from our clients and we uh do our best to accommodate those but it really has become something that is um it's changed there's there's more kind of users taking care of themselves maybe looking things up on youtube or sharing with each other and and it's interesting what that there's you know the costs and benefits of that. I mean, the benefits might be that you don't have to sit through a training as an end user that doesn't really hit you right. You don't feel like you gained a lot from that 45 minute session that you were asked to sit through. Um, so that's nice not to have to go through that. Um, I think sometimes though, um, we miss opportunities to sort of find out about the little hacks, little tricks, little tips that might make um, a platform easier 
to use. Um, and so Carolyn was suggesting that, you know, organizations might want to at least consider doing, you know, sort of brown baggy kind of like, not necessarily trainer to audience, but more audience sitting around a table sharing their ideas or what they do that makes, you know, their use of this, of the company's information systems uh, work better. And that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, Another thing that we were thinking about in terms of formal training is that the one place that formal training probably is still required, and this fits, again, back to Johan's point about the fact that we rolled out all this stuff without a lot of attention for governance. And so now one of the things that we have to do is circle back to governance and think about the rules of the road that particularly for important information systems for an organization where it's not just your outlook you know or your one drive you can have your one drive or your google drive can be as cluttered as you want it to be as long as you can find the files that you need and deliver them when you need to deliver them like that the rest of it is up to you no one cares but for places where there's collaboration like a a, a crm or a finance system where multiple people are plugging in data or or manipulating data you need to have rules. This is how the organization, this is how we do it. We put in, when we put in a record, we need to have this field filled in and this field filled in. You can leave this field empty if you want to, that's fine. But this field, absolutely you cannot, you cannot like hit okay until you fill this field in. And so training around those kinds of governance type um, activities where there's rules for how we do things is probably something that we're going to, uh, uh, there might be some you know, need to backfill some of that stuff in um, in, in the, in the years ahead. Yeah. I think the, the, you know, we've gotten to the cloud, we have the cloud solutions. Now we need to use them effectively. That requires standard operating procedures, you know, business processes and documentation. So I'm coming, I'm coming back with some really exciting things for 2023 <laughs> IT policy, standard operating procedures and, and business documentation. Sorry, folks, but that's truly like that's kind of where things are right now. Like those those are the things that really need attention um, in, in our experience heading into 2023. Yeah. And in the same vein, I think, you know, um, you know, users were empowered to um, find ways of getting things done when they were suddenly working from home. And if um, and if it you know worked for a department to to sign up for a Trello account or an Asana account and share it amongst themselves to get some of their work done, uh, that was fine. Um, but now I think sometimes people are circling back, organizations and particularly um, the people in charge of data at the organizations, which of course, I don't know if anyone's in charge of, of data at some organizations or not, but people that think about and worry about where is all of our data and, and what's it doing? I think there's a realization that um, all these cloud platforms do require some active management. You need to know, you know, what what platforms are in use, who's using them, how are they being used. Um, one of the most important questions that you want all of your employees to know the answer to is what to use when. It's a it's a funny question that Matt and I picked up at a Microsoft conference about about. Uh, I don't know, five or 10 years ago now where the, the seminar was, or the, whatever, the thing that we went to the hour long session was what to use when and it was, the idea was the, it was the Microsoft stack. So do you use, when do you use OneDrive? When do you use SharePoint? When do you use Outlook? You know, Microsoft has a million products and what to use when, but please, you know, whatever you're using has to be a Microsoft product. Well, that's not true for our clients. There's lots of, uh, there are lots of platforms outside of Microsoft's world that our our organization our clients are using, but you want your employees to know what to use when, and helping that establish those rules um, is uh, takes management and takes work. And I my job at the batting cleanup here is to circle back to everything, circling back to what Matt was saying. One of the benefits of SSO of single sign on is that that becomes then your gateway your your control point is the better word for it your control point for all of these platforms if if the way to get to the platforms that your organization makes available 
to its staff to get their work done is through a single sign-on platform, then you then you control there who has access to what and and um, you can even you know even the onboarding and offboarding of staff becomes easier through the SSO the single sign-on platform. Um, you know, just a, it's just an extra thing to consider as as all of the things that are on this slide that Carolyn's sharing again. You know, there's like lines you can draw between the different bullet points and circle and and this this affects this and that affects that. Um, a lot of a lot of this stuff all fits together. That was a great, great wrap up, Steve. Thank you for batting cleanup for us. <laughs> um, so yeah, I put up the um, this slide again, and we will be sharing. I forgot to mention earlier, so we're going to share all of these slides and the recording and podcast episodes and a transcript. So um, I hope nobody worried too much about taking notes today because that will all be available for you to follow up on it. Um, I want to go quick to our learning objectives. Uh, we we're hoping that you would understand some of the trends for nonprofit management, office trends, cybersecurity, and cloud technology. Um, thank you, Johan, for like all of the boring things that are the trends, um, governance, uh, maybe usability, uh, single sign-on and passwords, um, costs, self-training, user experience becoming more and more important, like training, formal training versus self-training, and that all wrapping back to governance um, of some of the things that we put in place maybe pretty hastily. And now we're going back and being a little bit more deliberative about it. So I want to thank Johan, Steve, and Matt so much for joining us and uh, sharing your expertise with us. Thank you all so much for staying with us here um, until pretty much the end. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, www.communityit.com, so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.